Sydney, it is one of its kind in the science, based on science, it's the only sort of, you know, uh, company with related to venture capital. It's established in 2004 and of late his interest on chemistry and particularly polymers based products or polymer related science, etc. He is conducting his research and also guiding many people and he is based at Pune and it is a really honor for all of us to hear him and learn from him. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. You can sit there if you wish to, you can see better. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for waiting patiently to hear me this afternoon. Uh, first of all, my thanks to Dr. Shahab, Professor Anup Ghosh, for making sure that I come here this morning and share this uh, interesting uh, discussion and conference with all of you. Uh, I start with a disclaimer. I think I see many of you are accomplished practitioners of the packaging industry. You probably know more about packaging than I know. And therefore, what I am going to talk about is just a perspective. There could be two sides of the story, so I don't claim to be absolutely right. But I just want to share some perspectives as to where we are coming from and where we are likely to go. I've always believed that the problems that we face today were created by technology. And therefore, the problems that need to be solved also will have to be solved by technology. And I think if that is the spirit in which we look at a problem, I'm sure we'll find the right solutions. So my talk, as I said, is a little bit of a perspective much of it, what I'm going to be talking about, is something that many of you would know and maybe know even better than me. The proposition that I wish to make today is that just like we have already made a pledge for a net zero carbon, is it not time for us to make a pledge for a net zero carbon which is based on plastics? Now, once I say this, we all know what net zero carbon is. The Glasgow meeting in November, where our Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister of India, has made a commitment on, all, on behalf of all of us that we, we will strive and bring the carbon to net zero by 2070, which is another 50 years from today. Is there a case for us to take a pledge today or tomorrow or day after tomorrow to say that we will bring the carbon in plastics to net zero by 2070. And if we can take that pledge, can we define a roadmap to accomplish this goal? And in this roadmap, can all stakeholders sit together and not defend their business and not support their existing businesses, but look at what needs to be done to realize the challenge of a net zero carbon in terms of plastics. And I'll show you that, which means predominantly plastics packaging, because that's where the carbon is getting wasted in our environment today. We need to secure that carbon back. We need to reuse that carbon back. And we used to make sure that we do not put more carbon through plastics in the environment than we can sequester, recover, and reuse. Now, is the same principle that we are going to use it for carbon dioxide today. 
And that's where the whole world is focused on, India is focused on, in terms of multiple initiatives that the government, the civil society, the industry is all focused on. Every industry has set for themselves what is called net zero goals. The question is, I haven't seen a description of a net zero carbon in terms of plastics yet in the discussions. And my case today is for us to set a time frame by which we will accomplish the net zero goals. And I think it's important for us to set this, make this pledge, because if we don't have a moonshot goal, we never get accomplished anything. So all of us, we know that we need a goal which is like a moonshot. Extremely difficult, very complex, wonder how we will do it. But if we can set a goal, humanity has proved over and over again that we will, de we will do it. So that's the basis of my talk. So let me proceed ahead with this, uh, with this premise and show you what I, some of the things are obvious which you know. How does this change, this one? How to point out where? Here, there. Then I can't walk, right? Okay, all right. So this is the basic idea. What are the issues that we have today. Now, why don't you stop that uh, screen there? Up. Yeah. OK. What are the issues that we are confronted with? And I'm sure all of you know this. The short life cycle in use, especially in the plastics packaging area, I call it in the eye of the storm today. Uh, mismanaged waste, urban and rural. We can always say we should not mismanage waste, but it's impossible not to mismanage waste. And therefore, we have to live with the reality that waste will be mismanaged. Lack of civic infrastructure, no availability of substitutes as of now. And there's a lot of civil society reaction to this. Uh, poorly conceived legislation, unforeseeable bans, difference in perspectives between producers, consumers, regulators, and untested solutions being imposed on all of us. In fact, I just want to tell you that next to the pharmaceutical and food industry, the plastics packaging industry is likely to be the most regulated industry in the next 25 years. Let's be prepared for that. Let's not cry that we are being regulated or we are being over-regulated, because that's the only thing the government knows how to do. The government has no solutions. It is we who have to provide the solutions. The government's only reaction is regulate. If the regulations don't work, over-regulate. If it doesn't work, introduce more regulations. Now that is what is going to happen. In fact, it is already we see the, we see the beginning of this over-regulation. In fact, as I said, next to the food and pharmaceutical industry, the polymer industry is going to be the most regulated industry in the next two decades. Okay, so let's not say, oh, why are we doing, why is the government doing all these things? The government is doing all these things is because we as people who are responsible for technology are not doing enough. If we do enough, the government will have no reason to intervene. And that's the message I think, you know, we should take because we always say the government is over-regulating us. The government only over-regulate us because we don't regulate ourselves. And if we learn to regulate ourselves, the government will not interfere with us. And that's the message I think we must leave this room with, because that's where the future lies. Well, the mismanaged waste, honestly speaking, and it's sorry to say that the less developed in the country, more is the mismanaged waste. And that's the slide that I show there. Therefore, this is called high-income countries, the, <clears throat> you know, what is called a middle income, and there are two levels of middle income, upper middle income and lower middle income, and the very low income. The very low income does not generate mismanaged waste because there is very little purchasing power. The very high income also generates much less mismanaged waste because they have technology and solutions to take care of waste. Unfortunately, their population is also less. It is the, it is the upper middle income and the lower middle income countries who are falling in between are the greatest generators of waste, and that is including the plastics waste. And I think that's what we have to understand. Now, 
So this is something we all know. I think this, this numbers are slightly a little outdated. 45% of the plastics we consume, 460 million tons of plastics, 45% is roughly 200 million tons of plastics, 210 million tons of plastics goes in packaging. And much of it in single-use packaging. That's the problem. So we are talking about close to 210 million tons of plastics being used in single-use packaging. Now, what's the issue? The issue, I have something, uh, can, you, can you switch this uh, on please, slide, because there are a couple of pictures below. Can you do that from that side? Huh? No. Okay, maybe I should have done this. Presentation. Next, next, next slide. Previous, previous slide. Previous, previous slide. Oh, PC time. Okay. Oh, oh, many are there. Oh, what's the problem? Okay. Okay. Now you can see this. No, now you can. Okay, so you see here, out of that 40% that I'm talking about, essentially 88% of this waste consists of only two materials, polyolefins and PET. And the balance, about 12%, is about polystyrene and PVC. So you can imagine, in terms of material, we are only talking about three big classes of material. Polyolefins, which includes HDP and polyethylene, and PET, which is, cons which is responsible for 88% of the waste that we generate. About 12% is roughly polystyrene and PVC. So one of the ways that we look at problems is we, we focus on the 80-20 rule, right? So maybe you have to focus on the 80-20 rule, look at what is the problem with polyolefins, and what is the problem are with PET. And some of my friends here will tell you that PET is no problem, which I agree, tend to agree. And therefore, if I say PET is less of a problem, then what we need to focus is entirely on polyolefins. And that is the problem. So this is just a way of reducing the complexity of the problem in order to look at it in a more meaningful manner. Now, so, Now let me go to my, I don't know which one will work. So the major issue we talked about is already ever accumulating waste in the environment, leakages. And the, in fact, we should be more worried about leakages than anything else. So I thought from a perspective of sustainability and responsibility, we must be more worried about leakages and how to avoid leakages. And that's the question that we have to ask. Let's not worry about what we can do once we are able to collect and aggregate. That's another problem, but that we have to look at it separately. But what we have to ask is, how do we prevent leakages, which we are not able to collect and aggregate? And that is the problem also we need to look at. And of course, there are lots of safety and you know, issues that we all know about. And of course, the fact that persistence is the biggest problem. So this is the issue that we are all aware of. Well, I always say that business as usual is unsustainable. And I think let's recognize that. It is absolutely true to understand that 
if we continue to do what we have been doing for the last 70 years or 50 years, it is absolutely unsustainable. We need to change course, and that is very important. Well, by 2060, we will have 1 billion tons of plastics waste in the environment if we continue to just go as we go. In fact, uh, plastics entering aquatic system will exceed 50 million tons by the time and actions are required both at regional and global levels, comprising a mix of fiscal and regulatory policies, and this is what the government keeps talking about. Much of it is all policies, regulatory, fiscal, but very limited discussion on technology, and that's where I'm going to come from. In a best case scenario, in fact, this is kind of, this is the latest report, this is a June 2022 report, which is just published a few months ago, in a best case scenario, if we don't change course, if we do not have what I call this net zero plastic carbon goal, we can at best decrease our waste by 33%. This is global. And we can prevent significant leakage to the environment, but we cannot eliminate it completely. So this is something that we have to understand that the best solution that we have today is not sufficient as we speak today. We need better technology, we need better solutions. And that is something that we will talk about in a few minutes. And what is so grave about this problem is India. Never in history have so many people had so much to throw away and so little space to throw it at the people of India in the second decade of 21st century. This is a problem, okay? And therefore, this is a complex problem. And any complex problem, as knowledgeable people, we must avoid offering simple solutions. We tend to do so because that is the psychology. When a complex problem, we offer some simple solutions so that people feel comforted. It's a danger, we should never do this. In fact, this was very well said by H.L. Mencken, for every complex question, there is a simple answer, and it is invariably wrong. And that is true of this particular problem we are talking about. Because we often offer very simple solutions, saying this will take care of this problem, this solution will take care of the problem, and we try to kind of ignore or push this problem under the carpet. And that is a wrong way to handle such problems. And I want to kind of impress upon you, the right way to answer the problem is to confront the question in all honesty and figure out what is it that we can all do together. And that's, I think, the solution that we need to seek for because it is not easy to make a choice. We all know this. Well, there are some widely held misconceptions, and I, get, I guess we all speak about this, and I feel these are all misconceptions. These are all simple answers, which are mostly wrong. Plastics do not pollute, but it is people who pollute. I'm sure you have heard about this, okay? All we need to do is to change the behavior of the people, and the problem will go away. Well, if it is so simple, let's do it. All plastics, Composition, shape, size, and form can be recycled. Hence, they pose no threat to the environment. Circular economy solutions are on the horizon. Most of us do not know what these are and what the complexities of these are. We think that this is some magic wand which will come, and when they become viable, all our problems will go away. And we use these words in public messaging very frequently. The circular economy will take care of all these problems. Without really understanding the complexity of circular economy and how are we going to manage the circular economy. Now we all fall back on LCA and everybody will tell you that LCA tells you plastics is very efficient because it has the lowest gas house gas emissions to alternative packaging materials. It's true, but it's only partly true. It is not the whole truth. Because no LCA, to the best of my knowledge on plastics, 
takes care of cradle to grave or cradle to cradle. It only takes care of cradle to gate. And therefore, it's incomplete information as far as I'm concerned, okay? Show me one plastics LCA, and I've been, I've been combing through the literature on this, which is cradle to cradle, okay? And you will not find one, because it's impossible, because we don't have data to even do LCA. That's a problem. Forget about India, I'm talking about globally, okay? Forget about India. In India, we have anyway no data, so no problem. We cannot do any LCA in India because we have very little data. Biodegradable polymers will soon become viable as packaging materials, and when it does, all our packaging waste can be composted. All these things are being told to us in different forums, and we are messaging this to the public. Let's be honest about it. To me, all these things are possibly true to a limited extent. They are possibly true, but they are not the whole truth. And that we must recognize, and therefore we are not telling the whole truth to the public at large. And that's the problem I have, and we need to convey in a very transparent fashion what is the whole truth. I always say I put recycling with an inverted commas. Recycling is not a solution for net zero carbon plastic carbon. We all know that we can recycle, but recycle only postpones the problem. It does not solve the problem. Because at some point of time, I need some place to put that carbon. You can't do infinite recycling. There is no such technology, especially with organic polymers. And therefore, recycling is not a solution, in my opinion. We should not keep on telling people, oh, recycle, recycle. It will solve your problem. Well, it will solve a problem in a little limited sense for a short term, but without looking at the net zero carbon, how are we going to do recycling and solving the problem? Where will the carbon go And ultimately? There is a mass balance, right, in this world. There is a mass balance. And that mass balance must be balanced, you know, in terms of the carbon that we are sequestering in terms of po polymers and the carbon that we are releasing in the environment. And without that mass balance, you know, it's not going to work. So it's a limited solution, and I think we must say that this is a short-term limited solution, but we need to come up with a better solution. That's the messaging that I think we should do, rather than saying that recycling will reduce or solve our problem. Well, recycling, I believe, only treats the symptoms of the disease. It does not address the disease. And we must recognize that particular aspect of recycling. And therefore, I put recycling in inverted commas. The reason I do that is because now people are using recycling in multiple connotations. And I will come back to it in a minute. And therefore, this recycling is a simple mechanical recycling that we are talking about, OK? A simple mechanical recycling, which I call it downcycling. And I wish we start using the term downcycling in order to understand that actually this is at the end of the day, this carbon will have to figure out, we need to figure out where this carbon will go. And without understanding where this carbon will go, I can't even do the full life cycle analysis. Well, we must also recognize that for many polymers, we don't have economically viable even recycling solutions. Okay? And I think we must recognize this. Because everything cannot be recycled that we produce. And my, my interest, and in, I've been telling this in many forums, why can't the industry, the stakeholders, the brand owners sit together and decide what is it that we cannot recycle economically? and do what is called a voluntary and proactive phase out of this material in a time-bound manner. Figure out what alternative solutions we can bring in. They'll always tell me it's more expensive, but I can tell you, ultimately, we as people pay the cost for sustainability. Sustainability is not free. Sustainability has a cost, and we all have to pay for it, okay? In the long term, we'll all end up paying for it. OK? We'll all end up paying for it. And therefore, that should not deter us from looking for alternative solutions. So this is important because we do have lots of these 
plastics packaging waste, which cannot be recycled or which should not be recycled for good reason. And we need to figure out what they are and we need to figure out how do we, you know, phase out or voluntarily stop making all these products. And this has to be our initiative. It is not why one day the government will come and tell you to stop it and then we will cry, okay? But why can't we, in a proactive manner, lay a, a, a road map and say, but in 10 years, in 20 years, we will reduce this by such and such a quantity. And then figure out what else we can do to substitute that. I think that's, that's the solution that we need to do. I already see the changes happening. If I was in a conference like this five years ago, I would have seen multiple PET bottles. I would have seen this made of plastics. Okay, I would have seen your bag made of PVC. Today, you have eliminated them, right? Did you ask what is the LCA of this compared to the plastic casing that you, you would have otherwise used? Did you ask what is the LCA of this bottle compared to the PET bottle that you would have used? But you have made the switch. Why did we make the switch? Not based on LCA, right? It is based on something else we made the switch. I'm happy that we are making the switch. I'm happy that this is a paper, okay, and not a plastic in which I have to figure out where to throw that plastic. That is the change that we are bringing in. And therefore, when it comes to these decisions, we don't go back to an LCA. Because we think that there's a greater problem to solve than worrying about LCA. And that is an issue also we need to worry about. Well, the concept of circularity that we keep talking about, and we, we keep talking about this, I want to spend two slides on this to show you, it's nice concept, it's elegant, it's appealing. Everybody will say, oh, circul circularity is a great concept. Nobody will disagree. But you ask people, how will you do this? And nobody has a clue, okay? Which means, how, uh, how do I recycle this carbon completely to make a net zero? How do I recycle the carbon that is present in a plastics back to a carbon without destroying the value of the carbon? And that is not easy to do. It is a very elegant concept. People are talking about it. I haven't seen, except a few companies here and there. In India, of course, nobody talks about it in terms of a roadmap or a game plan. But at least globally, people are talking about it. There is some merits. There are some great demerits. And I will explain to you what these are in a few minutes. There are lots of these so-called carbon to carbon technology now emerging. Many of them are in the startup phase. Many of them are small companies around the world. Unfortunately, none of the Indian manufacturers seem to be interested in any of these areas. So I'm very sorry to say that I think they have figured out that they will survive based on some imported technology at some point of time, So, which is okay as far as I'm concerned. There are lots of things that are happening, and these are called advanced recycling technology. So I use this word advanced to differentiate between recycling. This advanced recycling technology tends to preserve the carbon and bring it back into the use after its use in, in terms of, a, let's say, a packaging plastics. Well, there are many technologies. I will not give a uh, ex, you know, description of these technologies. There are very, some of them are interesting. Some of them are early stages. None of these technologies, the pre POC is established as of today, okay? It is still in what is called pre-POC stage, you know, experimenting, trying to work out whether it's feasible, look at all the downsides of these technologies and see what is the sustainability quotient of these such technologies. So this is under discussion, but I just want to show you a simple schematics. This is just for you to keep this in mind when you talk about circularity. This is my uh, appreciation of circularity, and the circularity is not a single circular complex. It's multiple loops that you have to manage, okay? So when you talk about circular economy, in fact, this word has become like as if it's a single loop, single circle. It is not a single circle. It is multiple circles, circles within circles that you have to manage. And that's where the complexity lies. That's where the problem lies. So it's very easy to say we will we'll do a circular economy, you know. But 
each one of you in your business, try and figure out for your own business, at least on a piece of paper, how will you manage it? How will you create it? And you will start understanding the difficulties. For example, I just show you one or two case studies. You know, I put here, the C is consumer, R is the conventional recycler, which is the classical downcycler, I call it. PM is the product manufacturer. M is a monomer or precursor. P is a polymer manufacturer. AMR is advanced mechanical recycling. ACR1, I call it advanced chemical recycling one, and advanced chemical recycling two, I differentiate them. Now these are the kinds of technologies that we are talking about today in the world. Now if you want to integrate these technologies into a circular economy, now you're going to have very complex situation. I'm a consumer, I throw away my plastic, it goes to a recycler, it goes back to some product manufacturer, some product is manufactured out of the recycle, then again it comes back to the consumer. Now you can't keep this loop going because this material will not withstand this loop infinitely. At some point of time, this will leak out. When it leak out, it has to go to an ACR1 or an ACR2. Otherwise, you can't recover the carbon. Alternatively, you can take it to an advanced material recycling, which is a very more complex process compared to the simple recycling that we're talking about. It can generate the polymer, and it can go back to the polymer manufacturer, the product manufacturer, and then come back into the same loop. Now, unless you integrate this whole thing within your system, you can't achieve circularity. Okay, anywhere you break this, you have broken the circularity. So please understand that it's very easy to say a circular economy, but it's a very complex issue to manage circular economy. And I think it's worthwhile for each one of us in the, I have done this with one company today with great detail with material flows. We have done this, you know, as a case study to see what complexities we are getting, you know, for one single product. And even that is so, you know, it's kind of so much complex that in order to manage the entire streams of waste that we have is something that we will require lots of heads and brains to work on, okay? Now, the point I'm trying to make is, after doing all the thing, you'll also say that my recycle cost should be lower than the virgin cost. It's never going to be so. Please understand that there's a price you have to pay for sequestering and recovering the carbon. And therefore, the carbon that you will recover and re recover at the end of the day will be more expensive than the virgin material. And that's the conundrum. As long as that condition continues, people will not do this. Because they would rather use the virgin material, which is cheaper. And that's exactly what is happening today. Okay? Because the cost of doing this is so high, that why should I do all these things and make a more expensive material? I would rather use a cheaper virgin material that is plentifully available around the world. And that's a problem. Now, this cycle has to be broken. At some point of time, my virgin material has to become more expensive, I mean, you know, my recycled material, my virgin material cost has to go up substantially. Unless that goes up, this cycle will never make economic sense. Now, that's another problem that we will have, and this is something that we, have, we all have to think about. Because today, the, the problem is, we are probably talking about a few million tons in all these circular economy technologies, whereas the world is putting close to 10 million tons of virgin polymers every year, you know? And they'll continue to do so for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So where will it, where is the competition? Where will the level playing field here? So the virgin material will continue to be much cheaper than the material produced by circular economy. And therefore, is this doomed? Therefore, the question to think, or what do we need to do to reverse this trend? is also a question to think. Well, remember the laws of thermodynamics, and I think we sometimes forget this in all our discussions. When we made the polymer from the monomer, we released energy into the environment, because most of the polymerization reactions are exothermic reactions, because you're forming carbon-carbon bond, carbon-oxygen bond, carbon-nitrogen bond, 
Therefore, they're all bond forming reactions are exothermic. You release energy. Now, when you want to recover that carbon back from the polymer, I have to supply energy. Okay? And that energy has to be at least the minimum of the heat that I released at the time I made it. Actually, it should be more. But it should be at the minimum what the heat I supplied at the time I made it. So in a net zero carbon, all that additional energy that I need to bring that carbon back into the system must come from net zero or net, net what I call net carbon neutral energy or net carbon negative energy. If you, if you spend on this you know, carbon positive energy, nothing is being, you know, no problem is being solved. Now, there is already a little bit of a discussion on this in the, lit in the world, okay, but the question is, do we have the means to do this, you know? And that is the question also we have to ask because circular economy is energy intensive. It's very energy intensive. And therefore, if you want to practice circular in a circular economy, I need a net zero carbon or a what is called carbon neutral or a carbon negative energy. Otherwise, we are not doing any service to the, you know, to the, uh, to the world at large. Well, this is something that we talk about. I'm glad there are people from cardboard and steel and aluminum industry here. And I think somebody, I mean, Terry has put out this report, which is, I think, a very interesting report. So we should not ignore alternative material based on what is called cradle to gate LCA. We have to do cradle to cradle LCA or cradle to grave LCA. And when you start doing that, some of the other materials become more attractive. Now, this is again not the whole story. One can debate endlessly on this, but the reason today is that cardboard, steel, and aluminum are pretty high on recycling rates, okay? Whereas plastics, wood, and textiles are pretty low on recycling rates, and that's the reality. And therefore, I think you will have to look at uh, this issue uh, of competing materials in packaging too, and not simply rule them out. Just a few minutes to say that biodegradable polymers, we keep on talking about it. I always say it's a very misused term in the, uh, in the industry today, and I think even our government regulators don't understand this. So they are making all kinds of regulations, all kinds of branding, which is meaningless in my opinion. But anyway, nevertheless, I think there is, it's a myth as far as I'm concerned. It's a very big myth that we are propagating, and uh, I think it is, you know, without, again, without defining the end point of disposal of a material, there is no property called biodegradability. Biodegradability is not a material property. Biodegradability is a property of the environment, environment in which this material finds itself at the end of its life. And this is something that we have misused. We are, we are terming a material as biodegradable. A material cannot be deemed as biodegradable until you specify to me where this material will ultimately end up. And, and without that end goal or the end resting place for that material, we should never talk about biodegradability. Uh, but we, end, we tend to say this is biodegradable and we can tend to please ourselves that we are very, you know, we are doing the right thing. But let us be cautious in making use of this term. I don't think uh, we don't have uh, a good material today. I will skip this, uh, the so-called bioeconomy people are talking about. To me, it's an utopian dream, okay? Uh, I mean, people are saying we can get from renewable material, we can get starch, cellulose, ferment, make chemicals, products, compost, and, and let it go back to carbon dioxide and water. And this is a circular economy we call circular bioeconomy. A lot of, lot of papers are being now written on this. Uh, again, to me, it's a very distant dream. It is not a solution to the problem that we are facing today. Uh, the problem is basically, I, I show this to many people because it's a very interesting slide. For packaging, you need certain barrier requirements. Without that, there is no packaging application, right? If this, if this barrier needs are not there, the packaging is not a problem at all. You know, we could have used any packaging material, okay? The problem is that when you want to dispose a biodegradable polymer, you need the same property which you needed in the 
packaging in order to degrade. That means I need essentially oxygen permeation, water permeation, microbial permeation, nutrient permeation, light degradation. Unfortunately, if all these were present, it will not be a great packaging material, right? So this is the conundrum. You've got two opposing needs, and you say that biodegradable polymers can do this. And that's therein lies, in my opinion, a myth, because you cannot, biodegradable polymers cannot meet these two opposing needs of packaging, okay? So that's something that we need to worry about. Therefore, I'm just, you know, as I said, the genie is out of the bottle, and today there's an intergovernmental panel, as you know, on plastics pollution. For the first time, plastics and pollution's word have been co-joined. First time in the history. Previously, plastics and pollution word were not connected. Now, officially, the plastics and the pollution term has been connected, so it's going to change the psychology of the people and the consumer at large. This is an intergovernmental panel, as you know, in March 2nd, uh, June, I mean, March, this has been announced. Uh, they have three years to come up with what is called a legally binding treaty. This will be like the Montreal Treaty, the Paris Convention, and the, you know, and the various other conventions. The first meeting is going to happen in another month or so. And this is going to look at plastics as a pollutant. And that, I think, should wake us up a little bit more. Because now, officially, plastics have been termed by a group of people, a group of government as pollutants, OK? This was never done before, you know, OK? So anyway, I leave this couple of slides, and then I will conclude. There are many new challenges. I think all of you are looking at it. Redesign, and I think I see nice initiatives to do this. New business models. Reverse cycles, these are all languages we use today. Sustainability quotient. Digitalization, enormous amount of digitalization efforts will have to be done if we have to make the, some of the ideas that we talked about work. Uh, we have to have agreed scale for defining ease of recyclability, ease of circularity, okay? We need better systems for labeling and identification. I hope that this is taken very seriously. We still depend upon this one to seven, you know, system that was conceived 45 years ago by SPE. In my opinion, this is outdated. We need much more transparent labeling for plastics. We need marker technologies. We need what is called food compatible packaging markers. We need machine readable labeling. Just like you have a, for a food, you have a nutrition labeling. We need for plastics something which is much more descriptive in terms of labeling. I believe that all these things are necessary, and I think we should voluntarily start beginning to build these systems into our industry, into our practice. Otherwise, that's one day you will be asked to do it anyway, whether you like it or not. Well, we need a lot of testing and certification uh, uh, capabilities. We don't have much in this country today. And I think I will not say much more about this, but we need a lot of testing and certification capabilities. It is not a single point test. It is not one test that will give you an answer. You need a multiple test to get an answer. And we don't have this kind of a ecosystem for this kind of a testing at this point of time. I always said that climate change, and somebody mentioned this, is an inconvenient and invisible truth whereas plastics waste is a convenient truth. You cannot see carbon dioxide. I think he mentioned it, uh, you know, he mentioned it in his initial remark. I didn't know that you were going to say this. Therefore, it's hard for people to believe that this lowly gas could be responsible for such, such catastrophic consequences on the planet. Plastics waste is visible and ugly. People feel its presence, which is good, because solutions will come faster. It is easier to handle a convenient truth than an inconvenient truth. And these problems are created by us, and it is within our powers to resolve them, if we set our mind. And therefore, the first steps towards the solution is to acknowledge that there is a problem. I sometimes believe that our industry, and I'm very honest about it, is not willing to acknowledge that there's a problem. They think we have all the solutions. I think we must acknowledge that there is no problem. And I think at the end, 
I just want to leave this. When a business is driven by profits, some thoughts about the planet is also very important, okay? Business is driven by profit. I have no problem on that. And in fact, there's a very nice cartoon that came in New York, I think this came in New York Times, a New Yorker magazine. A bunch of CEOs are sitting about 200 years later, okay? All right? And they are saying, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Well, that should not be the situation that some of us should find ourselves 200 years from today, okay? And I think that's a message I want to leave with uh, today. And I think, in summary, I think it is a, it's possible, but it's a formidable challenge. Let's understand the difficulties. Let's, let's find solutions that will go around these difficulties and not offer simplistic solutions as if there is no problem and everything can be handled. Uh, to achieve circularity is not easy. And I, that's what I wanted to tell you. It's a very complex problem and it's an energy intensive process, circularity. And therefore, we need to worry about, you know, again, the carbon that will come out of the energy that we will use. Uh, we need to consume, focus both on consumption and disposal. And of course, we need to shift this conversation. I keep saying this between what is called the devil versus an angel us against them, to something more meaningful and useful. And I said, you always see the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse, recycle. I have added three more R's, and they say, let's make it six R's. Reduce, reuse, repurpose, redesign, reinvent, and recycle, okay? And to me, the six R's are important. The only three R's, in my opinion, is incomplete, and I hope that we will incorporate in the future six R's into our you know, thinking processes. Thank you very much. I cannot go back and change the beginning. We, we, this beginning, six, 70 years ago, the polymer revolution began. 100 years ago, the polymers were discovered. And 70 years ago, it became an industry. And in my lifetime, this industry has grown from something like a few million tons to Few, few hundred million, I mean, few less than 100 million tons to 500 million tons in my lifetime. Okay? So basically, the problem that you have to face, ask is, you know, can I have this, right? So I cannot change this beginning, but we can start where we are and hopefully change the ending. And I think that's what we should already be doing in the future. So thank you very much for your kind attention.